Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. I'm Eric Hortness, uh, Executive Director of the Greater Madison Area Chamber of Commerce. Uh, joining me also today uh, to help lead the event is Eric Fosheim, Executive Director of the Lake Area Improvement Corporation. Uh, we're coming to you today from Heartland Consumer Power to discuss details surrounding the COVID-19 relief funds, which were allocated to the state of South Dakota through the SBA CARES Act. I'll turn it over to Eric Fosheim now for some introductions, and then we'll get into the main portion of the program. Thank you, Eric. Um, as you are likely aware, you uh, probably know that the state legislators met this past Monday uh, in a special session uh, to address the uh, COVID relief funds that were assessed to um, the state of South Dakota um, from the Federal CARES Act. Um, as any federal program um, has, uh, there's a lot of complexities um, that, that come along with it, a lot of misconceptions, a lot of confusion, um, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that uh, our local businesses uh, had the, the straight knowledge uh, from, from our, our legislators um, and wanted to make sure we could get those questions addressed if possible. Um, today we are uh, joined by Representative Marley Weezy, uh, Randy Gross, uh, and State Senator Casey Crabtree. Um, and they're going to help answer questions that, that you guys may have. Um, and hopefully we can get uh, some, some order to all of this. Uh, and I will start by turning it over to Senator Casey Crabtree. Thanks, Eric, and thanks, Eric, uh, both, both Eric's. Uh, so uh, pleased to be here today. Thanks for putting this, uh, this uh, forum together so quickly uh, so we can start getting the, the news out. We understand that there is uh, small businesses that are hurting um, health care uh, needs and, uh, and also our education programs uh, are, are needing some, some funds here. Uh, lots of uh, news about uh, the special session on Monday, and, and I'm hopeful today that we can go uh, into those details, make sure we get the, the information out uh, to folks in, uh, across District 8. And hopefully, uh, definitely when it comes to small business grants, that they can uh, look to us to uh, a little bit of guidance, but uh, also make sure that they're getting their stuff ready so they can get in there and get the need, the help that they, uh, they need. So uh, I'll turn it over uh, to uh, Representative Mar Marley Weezy, and I just I, I want to say thanks to both uh, uh, Marley and, uh, and Representative Randy Gross for their work uh, on this. I know on the, on the appropriations, it's a lot of work. Uh, for, for Randy uh, to work on this. They started in the spring, uh, lots of extra hours here to try to, to put this together. And so uh, although Randy and I have had lots of conversations and Marley about this not being perfect, we think it's a pretty good start. So I really appreciate them and, and uh, thankful that we had uh, two strong voices uh, with those two on the, on the House side uh, at the table. And then uh, Marley did a, a, lot of, a lot of work when it comes to health and education. So that's, uh, that's been fantastic. So um, Marley. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. We're really happy to have this opportunity to um, get some of the details of these programs out and to um, answer some questions. Um, in addition to the Monday special session that we had, um, the uh, legislature set up listening sessions for the five uh, main um, committees, um, local government, education, health and human services, um, energy and commerce, and ag. And I did listen in to most of them. Um, I didn't hit every minute of it, but I, I tried to listen as many as I could. Um, I especially focused, of course, on education and health and human services um, because those are my main areas of um, responsibility. And um, all the recommendations that came from all of the committees went on to appropriations, the Joint Committee on Appropriations, and they were the ones that had to put the final dollar figure to the um, to those um, recommendations. So um, if any of you listened or heard that there was a lot of emotional testimony on health and human services, where there were people who um, had patients in nursing homes and hospitals and they weren't be, um, able to see them. And so you know, there was a lot of ask for that kind of thing, like how can we um, do some kind of transitioning and, and try to um, get in to see our loved ones you know, can there, can there be funds um, put toward that? So that was, that was a big ask. Um, uh, there was a lot of uh, talk about wanting money for acute care, which of course um, we did come up with. There was um, a recommendation um, for housing assistance, um, which the appropriators found money for too. 
Um, and some of the other smaller recommendations, smaller asks, sometimes were combined into other, um, other parts of the, um, the budget that they came out with. Um, as far as education, there were, a f there were fewer recommendations, and, and the um, testimony was a little bit more sparse on that side. Um, but there were some concerns about liability issues, you know, what's going to happen if we shut down things and somebody sues, and, you know, so those things will be um, addressed down the road. Um, let's see. I think there was some talk about, you know, the long-term care facilities. Uh, a fairness issue came up that, you know, some of the long-term care facilities don't take Medicare Medicaid patients. So how do we how do we do that fairly? How do we get money out to to a lot of these different facilities and do it fairly? Um, a lot of people talked about money for testing, um, isolation, mitigation, plexiglass, and so I think the appropriators did a really good job of giving the giving that money to those um, um, entities and asking them to to use it, you know, in the best way they can, knowing that someday they might be audited and they would need to, you know, uh, prove that, that they actually spent the money the way it's supposed to be. So I think that is about all I have on my end of it, and I will hand it over to Randy. Thank you, Representative Weezy. I too would like to thank everybody for taking part in this, and those of you that were involved in uh, organizing and putting it together, we thank the folks here at uh, Heartland for allowing us to use our facilities and, and their technology equipment and making this available to all of you. It's been a long story, and I'll try and summarize several months here in a few minutes. One thing I want to keep in mind is that COVID was new to all of us. It didn't come with a playbook like so many things have, so we've all learned on the go. Just like you folks, so we and various committees and responsibilities in the legislature has, have learned as we go for a number of reasons. Like I say, there was no playbook, but also federal CRF guidelines have changed and been expanded as we've moved through the thing. The uh, questions would get raised, the feds would answer some of those questions, expand on their answers, clarify answers. A different question would get answered from another part of the country and they'd take it the next step and continue to expand and clarify on, on those. We expect that process to continue as well. Uh, this is not a set in stone, nothing's ever gonna change going forward, even though it's not that far until the end of the year. As has been said too, we'd like to recognize that there's, there's no perfect program, whether it's this or anything else, programs, policies, procedures have limitations, but we hope that what we've done here is, will benefit the most to the most who need it, and that we'll learn and modify going forward as changes occur. With that, I'm gonna walk through a few things, and you should have, or will have in your reference material, a couple of pages with a lot of numbers on them. And rather than recite a lot of individual numbers, I'm gonna to refer to sections of those. The first page is the one that at the top of the page has the $1,250,000 number in a box in the upper right-hand corner. And it's labeled South Dakota Coron Coronavirus Relief Funds, or CRF. The second, second page, again, lots of numbers, has fiscal year 2021 stimulus expender authority estimates, not CRF. With that in mind, I'd say there are two, as I just mentioned, and, and maybe even three elements to some of the COVID funding that we've seen occur since this outbreak occurred early in the year. One is CRF funds. Those are funds that are expended by the state under federal regulations or federal guidelines and regulations. And the minimum any state received under that program was $1.25 billion. South Dakota got that minimum, and that was based on state's population. So. Nebraska, Montana, Wyoming also got that. I was also told that uh, some of our adjoining states to the east, you know, Minnesota and Iowa, because of larger populations, receive larger numbers. And I'm sure the Illinois, New York's, California's of the world received, received even significantly larger numbers. But on a per population base, we in a small population state like South Dakota received a pretty high number. So that's the CRF funds. That's the first page of the in information. The second is other programs. The second page of that handout, the one labeled not CRF. Those are funds that are used only as determined by specific federal programs. In other words, the money was not passed on to the state to decide how to use it. It was passed on to the state to administer, <coughs> excuse me, based on an established 
or created federal program that said, for education, here's X amount of dollars, or for health care, this program, here's X amount of dollars. If you look on that uh, page, labeled not CRF funds, and down the left-hand column, it shows the state agency that administers those funds on behalf of the federal government. DSS, Department of Social Services, DHS, Department of Human Services, Department of Veterans Affairs, Department of Corrections, Department of Health, uh, and it goes on and on, Board of Regents, the Governor's Office of Economic Development, Department of Public Safety. Those are all just abbreviations for the various departments within our state government that manage those funds as told by, by the federal program. And like I say, there was a formula for each of those that, that determined how much an entity or an individual got. All funds under both of those programs, as Representative Weezy's alluded to, are subject to federal audit. And, and if it is determined that there was not, they were not used in accordance with federal guidelines, they must be repaid by the recipient. That's one of the reasons for so much caution in some of this. We want to do it right not only for the state's benefit, but for the benefit of all of our citizens throughout the state. Nobody wants to be told later on, hey, you got some money, you got to pay it back, and you've already used it. That's a tough situation for anybody and everybody to be in, and we'd like to avoid that if at all, if at all possible, still while helping as many people as possible. The third element of the funding, which we will not get into a day, but I think needs to be addressed because it indirectly impacts some of these, was federal COVID funding that was managed directly by and dispersed by the federal government. Some of the best aspects of that, or, or easiest aspects, I guess, to say of that, are some of the money that went out to our farmers and ranchers, so much per animal, so much per hundred weight of milk and stuff. And we in the state don't even know how much that amounts to because the money did not flow through the state coffers or state agencies in any way. It went from directly from the federal government through a farm service agency or some other organization like that to the producers. And so it's it's clear that it was a large sum, a significant sum in many cases, because we, we know what uh, people got per head, but we don't know how many head people had, had for instance, or, or how many people applied. But we do know it was substantial and needs to be kept in mind, because as you look through some of these programs, for instance, agriculture is not addressed directly in a lot of ways, but obviously a lot of agricultural producers did receive a lot of funds from the federal government as a result of COVID needs. So that's the third element that is significant. Little timeline background then, if I'm still okay on time. This started back in March. Regardless of when COVID itself actually started, efforts started on this at the state level in March. At that time, knowing that this, there was federal money coming to help with some of these needs, the legislature appropriated 75 million in funds spending, and that's what you see at the top of the first page. The top category on the first page it starts out with reemployment insurance fund of around $46 million, but if you look at the total of, subtotal of that first category, it's just under $75 million. The legislature in, in March authorized, appropriated that expenditure of $75 million. The largest amount, as I said, $46 million, went to reemployment fund. We knew that was going to be a need because right, right away unemployment bounced up. And if the fund drops below certain levels, all employers are assessed and have to replenish that fund. So it would have hit all employers significant and further compounded issues they were dealing with. Other funds, as you can see in that list, and I'm not going to go into the detail, went to the Board of Regents, to public health, public safety, and things like that. Section two on that same page is expenditures, and sections three is obligations. And they really fall into the same general category. The only difference between between them is section two, the checks have been cut. Section three, the money's been set aside for that purpose. Those are things that have been worked on and decisions made since March by the governor and her team and legislative involvement. And they were included in the appropriations authorization that was passed this past Monday. There's significant dollars there as well as you can see. One of the big ones, and we saw press releases on several of these over the past few months, you heard that there was $200 million designated for local governments. To find that $200 million, you look at, in the section sec second section, and get my tongue going here too, South Dakota Local Government COVID Recovery Fund, $46 million, is the second line there. And in the sec third section, the first line, is South Dakota Local Government 
COVID recovery fund, 153 million. You add those two together, and that's that 200 million you saw in press releases earlier this summer. All the difference means is some of the money, the checks have been cut, and some of the money is still there available to those local counties, towns, and other local government entities. We've also had some feedback that a few of those smaller communities in particular don't have some of the needs they thought they had. They don't have the infrastructure in terms of health and human services. Uh, systems like that are requiring for some of the funds that we're seeing in the bigger cities. So we fully expect the level of need on some of these to change as we go forward. The K through 12 grants that were announced earlier by the government, by the, by the governor's office, excuse me, are included on there. And that's the, there's eight, $18.7 million there. Additional funds to be needed to be to maintain the reemployment fund are in there as well. If you notice in the third section, there's a hundred million dollars in there. That's a guesstimate, but we do know that the unemployment, the, even though our state has recovered extremely well and unemployment is dropping, the fund took a big hit, and you don't know how big a hit until after the fact. We don't want to run short on that because, as I said, that would affect all employers pretty significantly. The Joint Appropriations Committee then has been working throughout the summer regarding how to make the best use of CRS funds. That would be the remainder, largely the fourth main subcategory on that first page. A few, few qualifiers about any of this. As has been alluded to, all funds under the CRF program must be spent by December 30th of 2020. They can't be carried over, they can't be set aside for money to be spent next calendar year. They can't be held in reserve. If they're not spent by December 30th, they go back to the federal government and South Dakota citizens will not benefit from them, at least not in this, this calendar year. We developed, we being the Joint Appropriations Committee and members of the, other members of the legislature looked into a number of programs that we thought might benefit our citizens. For example, we talked about a sales tax holiday. Some of you may have heard that in general discussion. The idea being that if, for instance, in the last few months of the year, if you went in to buy something for $100, instead of paying the sales tax on it, you would get it without sales tax, but the retailer would have a receipt that would show the amount of the sales tax and be able to reimburse, be reimburse that by the state government from the COVID funds. Great idea, a lot of people thought. Not eligible under federal guidelines. Another one that has some similarities that was developed was a capital purchases property tax credit where if, if I'm a farmer, for instance, and have a $30,000 a year property tax on my farm or ranch, but I go out and, and buy a piece of equipment for $20,000 and pay cash for it, or even credit, but I pay $20,000 for it, take my receipt into the county treasurer and use that $20,000 to offset $20,000 of my property tax. The treasurer then could use that receipt, again, get reimbursed by the state so the county is not out the money. The idea being that capital expenditures grow business, employ people, keep us going. Again, we're told not eligible, even though it's a great idea, not, simply not eligible. So you may have heard of other programs like that as well that sounded good. The reason they probably didn't get included somehow in the programs is the federal guidelines simply didn't allow for it as much as we would have liked to have tried. And we've looked at what other, other states were doing to get ideas. It wasn't just uh, South Dakota legislators or governor staff working in a bubble on this. We were looking as hard and as far as we could to get ideas. Am I still okay on time, Casey? Okay. I know I get to ramble sometimes and I apologize for that. Some had felt also, and some still do, that the December 30th deadline will be extended. And it may. The difficulty with that is we've come to learn over the last few weeks that very little is going to come out of Washington, D.C. until after the elections. The problem with that is if we wait till after the elections and even do get an extension, the window to disperse this money becomes very short and make some of these decisions. We felt we owed it to South Dakota citizens to get programs in place that can benefit them now. If you're hurting, you don't want to have to wait. You want to get the money now. Given that, the uh, appropriators felt it was essential to have a mechanism for obtaining citizen and industry input on how funds might best be used. And Representative Weesey mentioned we had listening sessions that were held in late September. Commerce and Energy Committee, Ag and Natural Resources Committee, Education Committee, 
Health and Human Services Committee and Local Government Committee. And granted, there are other committees in our state government, but those cover the bulk of the organizations and individuals impacted by some of the COVID hurt. Again, many ideas surfaced, as Representative Weezy said. Some simply didn't meet the federal eligibility guidelines, like a sales tax holiday. I think others at that time said, hey, that'd be great. They were told during the listening sessions, love it, can't do it. Eligible programs that came through those, and, and Senator Crabtree and Representative Weesey may expand on those a little bit as they get into some of the actual programs, were incorporated into how we used the Section 4 on that first page money. We tried to structure the programs as best we could to, establish, to, to not establish separate management systems. In other words, simplicity. It may, be, may have been great to set, set aside a million dollars for XYZ program, but if that required administration overhead management, it was prob probably easier to lump that million dollars into some other program that allowed it to happen that way, but didn't set up separate administration. That's part of the simplicity philosophy. In summary, before I pass it over to uh, Senator Crabtree to talk about the Small Business Grant Program, throughout this process we've kept several philosophies in mind. One has been to push as much assistance as we can to those most in need. Another one, we don't want to be in the role of picking winners or losers. And the COVID problem is doing enough of that without our help. One of the things we did in the programs then is said it's not first come first serve. It's going to be we want all the applications in the hopper and if funds have to be prorated, so be it. But that treats everybody equally. We're not going to try and pick winners and losers. As I alluded to in my example earlier, we're going to try and keep it simple, keeping in mind that this, we have to have applications out there, applications processed, and checks cut by December 30th. So simplicity becomes important. The overriding thing, and I've mentioned it several times, is that the federal guidelines still have to be adhered to as fast and simple and as nice as we'd like to do things. We've still got to follow the rules. And in summary, I'd say that we recognize again that there's no perfect program and the future may require modifications. With that, I'll pass it over to Senator Crabtree. Thank you, Representative Gross. I'm going to uh, move down, uh, down the original sheet there that is the South Dakota Coronavirus Relief Funds, the CRF funds, and uh, take us through the first three on the grant proposals. And I had an opportunity to participate on the Ag and Natural Resources Committee. And one of the things we really looked at is, do we set up separate programs? Do we try to do uh, something that's completely different uh, from small business to agriculture? And, and instead, uh, uh, the whole entire group uh, agreed we want to cast a, a net that is wide that catches everybody who may have slipped through the you know slipped through the cracks previously uh, those who maybe weren't eligible for other federal uh, assistance um, in the spring so so that's it, the intention of of these three uh, small business grants and so I'll walk you through three of them so there's a small business grant that is 400 million dollars that, that is uh, set aside for that there's another small business grant that is designed for the nonprofits and there is a third uh, small business grant which is designed for startups or new businesses so we wanted to make sure that we got uh, all of those folks uh, covered there so it, there's a total of 450 million dollars in there to, to help those uh, as Randy said uh, help those that that need it the most and so uh, we think this does a, a pretty good job of that um, I would say that I think uh, you know we don't know how many applications we're going to see uh, we don't know what they're going to look like in each one of those three buckets um, so things could change along the way so you're going to hear me say this uh, as I go through the details of the small business grant uh, when in doubt apply and, and I'm going to say that over and over and over again because we don't know all the details of how this is going to uh, unfold um, with the application so if you're showing a need uh, between 2019 uh, and 2020 then then apply and uh, and we'll see uh, see how uh, things unfold um, in its entirety so uh, some dates to remember October 12th through October 23rd those are the dates that the application window opens so that's the plan. That's, that's the plan. Um, so they're working. Uh, I had a conversation uh, with uh, the folks at the uh, Bureau of Finance and Management uh, yesterday. They were working uh, with firms uh, to get that open uh, by the 12th. So let's, uh, let's plan on the 12th through the 23rd. Um, either way, what I think we can plan on is a short window to get your application in. 
Um, so I think it's uh, I think it's important to start getting your numbers ready now uh, for 2019 and 2020 from the dates of March 1 through the end of August. So uh, start looking at uh, getting your financial statements together for for those for those pieces. So I think that's the things to work on right now, and uh, um, you know I'll. I'll Keep uh, kind of preaching that, that, that you need to get your financials ready uh, from March 1 to the end of, uh, end of August uh, and have them prepared because the, the window is going to be short, whatever the, the application window is. So I'll just walk you through uh, the, you know, it's called the South Dakota Small Business uh, Grant Program. And this is the, the $400 million that, uh, that, is, that is sitting out there that has um, gotten a lot of uh, uh, I guess news around it, um, but there hasn't been much released on details. And so we'll walk through this uh, a little bit. And then uh, again, I encourage you to apply. And so you're gonna hear me say that a number of times through this. Um, so the federal funds uh, are available at a total of $400 million and they're maxed out uh, of, at a grant of $100,000, but no less than $750 per qualifying business. So uh, eligible business obviously must be located in South Dakota. Um, they have to show a reduction in, in business of at least 25% um, and do not have gross revenues exceeding 38 and a half million. The 38 and a half million, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's a federal guideline for that separates small business. As much as anything, yes. As much as anything. So, okay, so so 38, you know, they got to be less than 38 and a half million, um, and then showing a reduction in business of 25%. Again, I will say this if your numbers show 15% or 20%, I would encourage you to get everything ready and apply because we don't know how this will unfold. So, um, we may not get that far. That's a very, very possible that it all goes for those that are that have uh, uh, financials that are showing a loss of more than 25 percent but apply anyway uh, so let me just kind of walk through uh, how we get to that number it is uh, your 2019 cash flow from operations uh, so that is 2019 income March through August minus your 2019 cash expenses March through August so those are the important dates that excludes depreciation amortization and non-cash expenses so that takes you, uh, um, that's your 2019 numbers. Your 2020 numbers are, again, 2020 cash flow from operations is 2020 income, March through August, minus 2020 cash expenses, March through August, excluding depreciation, amortization, and non-cash non expenses. So we take that. Um, we also want to know, um, or you're going to want to know, your federal aid amount that you received. So if you receive PPP, um, that may, depending on what the application, final application looks like, it may just ask you to, to input that, but you're going to need to know what you got for PPP uh, dollars. So have that, have that ready because um, that's going to go part of this uh, uh, formula. So the reduction in, biz and the reduction in business that, that they're talking about on the application is 2020 cash flow from operations minus 2019 cash flow uh, from operations plus your federal aid. So let's say, and, and Randy will just run through a, a scenario here. Um, you go through it and you show um, that your business lost more than 25%, that that loss between 2019 and 2020 is, let's say, $80,000. But let's say you also received $30,000 in PPP money. That means your eligible amount that you'd be available to receive in grant funds is 50000 that correct? Yes, subject to proration, but yes. Okay, and so if, if you didn't catch it on the microphone, what Randy said was subject to proration. Um, there's always this possibility that we get thousands and thousands and thousands of applications, um, which would, in, 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 I guess, in effect, dilute the amount of, of funds that, that you, each business would receive. So I think it's worth noting this, and, and I think uh, Representative Gross hit on this earlier, it is uh, not on a first come first serve basis. So uh, everybody can go into that deal and, uh, and is going to be you know, eligible if, you're, if you show this loss over that time. Anything to add to that, Randy? No, that's good. Sounds good. Okay. So again, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, and, and I'm glad that the Chamber, and the LAIC, and, and several other uh, organizations, including the paper, are here because we want to push this information out. I think this is the most important thing that we can get out, is that there is help available for those uh, that need it. And uh, we, uh, we want you to apply. We want to see if we can get this news out so, so folks, can get that, folks can get that help. 
So that is a, the small business grant program at 400 million. I'll, I'll briefly walk through this too. There is almost the same formula set up and $40 million set aside uh, for small nonprofit businesses. So the first one would be your, would be your typical for-profit business. The next one is your nonprofit. So if you, uh, if you are a 501c3, 501c6, um, I think all those, uh, all those are, are eligible to apply. All the same things um, uh, exist with the formula. So the formula is the exact same. The grants are still maxed out at, at $100,000 on that. Um, grants uh, less than $750 will not be rewarded. So that's still, that still sits there. Um, you still have to show a reduction in business of 25%. Um, if you're, you know, some, uh, we'll say reduction in business is the same as reduction in contributions, uh, things of that nature, uh, memberships, uh, investors, whatever it might be, on uh, however you want to term that for your, for your nonprofit. You. And that is cash income, uh, as Randy uh, said. So it's, again, same dates, same formula to show the 25% reduction. And there's uh, 40 million uh, set aside for that. The last one, uh, which is one that, uh, that uh, you know, I think I spend a, a lot of time on uh, with, uh, with appropriators on the Senate side and also with, uh, uh, with uh, Representative Gross, but there is uh, 10 million set aside for small business startup grant programs. So it's, it's termed startup, uh, but it could be termed new business. Uh, those kind of work the same. Now, I don't want you to think of a new business as in you bought a business. So if, uh, if Eric bought a business uh, that existed from 2015 to 2020, or 2018, and then bought it in 2018, he can probably use those historical numbers. So this is really a, a startup business or a new business. Um, and uh, so we look at that, same things apply again. Uh, the grants are, mar are maxed out at $100,000, uh, located in South Dakota. Um, but there's some things that, that really change in here. So uh, what's important here, application date is the same, but there's some other dates that, that you need to be aware of. So you have to uh, register with the Secretary of State or the Department of Revenue between September 1, 2019 and June 1 of 2020. So those dates, those dates are important. If you don't fit right into those, again, I would say I encourage you to apply. But just note those, note those dates are what they're looking at uh, first. Um, so you have to be open and operating on the, da on the date of application. So there, uh, this is really, uh, some of this is to, is to keep somebody from applying that, that maybe had an idea but isn't open and operating yet. Um, so we want to be careful and good stewards with, this, uh, with these dollars, of course. Um, and then here's where we change a little bit because you wouldn't have the financials to, sh to show how you compared 2019 to 2020. So uh, just to kind of walk you through this, you'd have to demonstrate an average monthly income during the period between March 1 and August 31st was less than 120% of the average monthly income prior to March 1st, or that the business operated at a net loss on a cash basis. Everything's been on a cash basis that we explained so far, but that's how this piece would work. Uh, this is, uh, in, and you have to, okay, so going back, operate at a net, uh, net loss cash basis in at least three of the six months between March 1, 2020 and August 31, 2020. Uh, so that kind of walks you through some of that. Any, anything to add to that, Randy? Not much to the uh, startups, uh, but again, goes back to some of the federal regulations. Federal. COVID aid is not intended to help new businesses get going in the future. That's why those dates are all in the past as far as you had to have had a plan in place to start up versus had an idea now and maybe you're going to start it in January of 2021 or something like that. The COVID money is to help people who had things in place. The wheels were turning for a note towards a new business and were harmed. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I had uh, somebody uh, kind of explain it like this. Uh, let's say you're augering a, a post hole, and uh, so you, you, dig that, you dig that dirt up. Um, we're, you know, this is to, to put that dirt, so to speak, back in that hole. It's not to, not to create a new hole and put new dirt or, or do things of that nature. So it's really to, to, to help those that were harmed the most through this, through this process. And again, we had a ton of good ideas that came out in Ag and Natural Resources and several of the other uh, committees. Uh, uh, some ones that I really liked were you know, loan programs uh, that, that helped uh, maybe with LAIC, um, things of that nature, infrastructure things, things that would uh, help new business uh, flourish. Unfortunately, 
the feds don't allow that. So that's uh, that was an ineligible uh, ineligible cost. Uh, some other ones that we had. Um, that uh, that Randy uh, and I know uh, Representative Weezy, we had many conversations on was related to the meat processors, and that took a lot of conversation at the Ag and Natural Resources Committee. Um, but the meat processors, for the most part, have have done really well th through this period, so they haven't really fit into this. But we know we have a pinch point there, and uh, and we have some uh, strong commitments from uh, both chambers to try to help uh, the meat processors uh, later. Uh, so we can help our producers and uh, and obviously our consumers. So uh, so that just lots of good ideas. Just that there's some some narrow guidelines that uh, that we have to fit into. So uh, that kind of wraps up the small business uh, grant program, I believe. One point. Yes. This has been great information, Casey, and I appreciate your summarizing it so well. I would make one point, as he said, when in doubt, apply. But keep in mind along that. If you're, say, a farmer and say, well, I'm not a small business, yes, you are. It doesn't matter what type of business you are to be considered a small business. And the same with nonprofits. Well, I'm such and such. If you're any sort of nonprofit, apply. And that, you know, that could be any number of things, uh, structure-wise or, or, or in terms of the business, what you, the service you provide or what you do, this, whether it's nonprofit or profit. Don't say, I, I file a Schedule F or I file this different. It's not a Schedule C, business C. Apply. You are, it's not meant to exclude types of businesses. Any business is potentially eligible. That's true. We, we uh, I think, all agree that there was enough uh, guidelines put in place uh, from the feds on this that the last thing we wanted to do was put any uh, extra layers uh, uh, of guidelines or restrictions at the state level. So uh, we did not go and create any special programs that were for uh, say the meat processors or, or uh, individual business. It was again to cast that. Open uh, up the programs we've got. Yeah, to open up to open up what we got, cast that net as wide as we could, so that we made sure that we caught uh, caught everybody. So, uh, with that. Okay, um, there's just a few more things if you um, get a chance to look at these documents. Um, as far as the grant proposals, I think I told you before that a lot of the things that came out of the listening sessions were um, sent to G J JCA and they did um, bundle some of those. So there's the community-based health care providers um, received 115 million, acute care hospitals 15 million, and then I mentioned the housing, um, rental, utility mortgage assistance got 10 million. Um, as far as the adult education um, listed in that uh, of 2 million, that was talked about a little bit. I think JCA maybe talked about that a little bit more than we actually did in education. That was kind of a governor um, request. And um, as far as the destination marketing um, for the advertising, tourism is huge in our state and um, that money was um, set aside, five million um, for that advertising. And then at the very bottom, um, we talk about how some of these um, monies maybe won't be used and will be reverted and so some of the ideas um, that we had to use those um, funds were uh, connect connectivity for at-home learning for low-income families and broadband grants, which um, are really important to our school kids that might be um, learning from home. So unless you have anything else to add about those, we will open it up for questions that we might have. Sure, I'll go ahead and, and start. And a lot of these questions were uh, questions that we've been hearing either at the chamber or LAIC quite often. Um, and I'll start off with, are there certain types of businesses that aren't allowed to apply for the small business grant? I'll, I'll jump on that one uh, again, uh, and I kind of, I think I alluded to this earlier, but the, the point of these programs was not to say uh, certain businesses could apply or, or, or couldn't. I mean, it is, it is to help those who need it the most. So if you're showing a loss of 25%, uh, 2020 versus 2019, uh, then you should apply. Um, so no, there is not businesses that, that, that don't qualify, I guess, based on what industry they're in. And Senator Crabtree, um, even those that may fall short of that 25% but are still showing a loss, um, you know, when you're talking about don't be afraid to apply, you're probably alluding to some of those businesses as well. Yeah, and we don't know 
how many applications we're going to get in. Uh, so we don't know if all of that will get used. We don't know, um, I, you know, we think that there's some money elsewhere, you know, other, in other places of that budget that, that may come and be eligible again before December 30th, so by the, by the end of the year. So I think there's a chance we see, uh, see more funds there. So I just, it, it doesn't cost you anything to apply. So go, so go through it. It's going to be a simple process. Uh, they have assured us that the application form is going to be easy, available online, um, so that you can fill that out. And I, I, I would encourage you to, to apply if you're showing a, showing a loss. I second what Senator Crabtree said. And as I said early on, there's no playbook with COVID as, as we got into it. And so a lot of what we've got put together we think is good but it is guesstimates in terms of how many people are eligible for various things, what the need is for various things. It's, you can't just send out a survey and, and say, how much do you need? Because everybody would say, how much have you got? But uh, we will learn a lot in this process, and that's also one reason for, for having a fairly narrow window of applications, because if we get applications in and say, hey, there's money left over, we want to get that back out, and that's where maybe the 25% figure could be adjusted later on to allow more people to qualify. And I'd second what the Senator said. If you're on the line, get your application in because you'll already be in the hopper then if we have a second round for any need. I would say the same on the dates with the, with the startup grant as well. Oh, yeah. um, so I, I think if you're, if you're close and you say, hey, I don't, I don't fit one of these things, um, I, I think you should still, still apply. This question is probably more towards Representative Weezy. Um, there was talk of funding for care centers that were dealing with isolation of residents. How does the grant help families deal with that situation? Yeah, that's that's where I talked about some of the testimony that came through um, the Health and Human Services listing session, where um, you know they talked about do we need a separate room? Do we need to remodel a room? Do we need to have you know, just a separate place. And then they got kind of in the weeds about maybe we could um, build on to do this. And, and so that's why when it went back to JCA, then they said, well, we're gonna group this together. We're gonna let you guys decide how to do this, but it wouldn't be for new construction. Um, but I think, I think all of the long-term long care facilities are, have that concern that they wanna have families um, meet with their loved ones and it's been really hard to be separated from them. Some of them have lost loved ones and were never able to see them. So I think uh, we're counting on those long-term uh, long care institutions to, to use that money for that purpose. If I may, I'll second what Representative Weezy has said. It, it's certainly a, a concern that we in the legislature recognize and, and, and understand and sympathize and agree with. But a couple things came into play. One, as originally proposed by the listening session, a specific grant for those type of facilities would have allowed some facilities who are operating profitably, maybe because they're not taking many Medicaid patients, that sort of stuff, to qualify for grants. And, and we felt it should go to where the need was greatest. And so by including the money with the, the general larger fund here, it doesn't preclude anybody from doing, any facility from doing, using these funds to do that. It's just that if you're operating profitably, you should be able to do it from your own cash flow versus this type of money being directed towards those who most need it. And then as Representative Weezy alluded to, construction projects, the money has to be still be dispersed by December 30th, that becomes a factor. If you can get it done that quick, and the, the money will be available for you if you qualify otherwise, but getting it done that quick is a big hurdle. Uh, you know, you, all three of you have touched on, you know, making sure you get your kind of ducks in a row before the, the application opens up with uh, incomes and expenses. Uh, are there other things that businesses should be doing now to get ready for the application to open up? Are they going to need to submit profit loss statements or is there other paperwork that they can get ready before the application actually opens up? Yeah. Can you go ahead? That's fine. Okay. So I, again, I, I would go back. I would be getting uh, your 2019 P&L. 
uh, balance sheets ready for that time period. So uh, March 1 to the end of August. Um, and I would do that again, obviously, for 2020 as well, March 1, end of August. So I would get uh, your financials ready. Uh, the other things I can think of right away is get your tax ID number ready, because that's how you're going to match up uh, your tax ID number. The name of your business are going to have to match up uh, when you go through that application process to make sure that the business is uh, is you know legit and operating, so that's what they're going to be going to be checking on that side, um, and then the funds are going to be dispersed back uh, via ACH, so um, your banking uh, information routing um, number, uh, those things you're going to want uh, you know available uh, so that you can get that uh, back in, but. Uh, my thoughts would be to, uh, to to get to work on those financials to make sure you have those ready. The window is going to be fairly short. We're hoping again for October 12th. That window is short, um, and, and I think that's really the thing. Even if you don't meet all the criteria, that window might not ever open back up. So, Absolutely correct. Uh, so depending on how you keep your records, you may have to spend a little bit of time sorting out those six months that are identified in the application. Uh, the other thing people need to remember, and we haven't mentioned this before, is this is for businesses that will certify as being a going concern. In other words, if you shuttered your doors and don't plan to be in business going forward, you're not eligible. This is to keep those who struggled getting by and are plan on being in business going forward. It's not to uh, hand money to folks who've gone out of business and quit business on, and not a going concern. Yep, good point. And I've heard some of uh, the nonprofits talk about how they, you know, haven't really done any grant proposals before. And, and I, I have been assured that it's going to be a simple process. So I'm, I'm counting on that to be true. Yeah. So I don't think anybody should be scared of, of applying. Take a look at it. All right. Um, are there specific dollars associated with testing and or contact tracing? Well, I could I can jump in and, and start, and I'm sure Representative Weezy will want to talk a little bit more about the healthcare side. But uh, with the dollars, it was meant to get that back to the folks that need it the most, and they could decide uh, from there, you know, what to use it on. So nothing says specifically you have to use it for this or or that. It has to be an eligible eligible cost. But uh, when it comes to our healthcare. Um, and then a lot of the state entities that, that receive funds, um, they can do that. To, you know, they can use that to uh, upgrade their testing uh, capabilities um, and, and proceed from there. Yeah, that, that was a specific recommendation that came out of the listening session um, that they really wanted. Um, I can't remember how much it was. I think that was a $15 million to go for testing. And, and there again, I agree, we, we decided to give that money to those entities and, and have them use it in the best way that they thought possible. And that might very well be um, for testing. Some of it was just, it wasn't so much the testing, but the testing supplies. And so we thought they could work that out um, in their own entities. Sometimes with this wide net philosophy, which I think is a good term, it's better to look at it and say, are there things we can't do? Because it's meant to say there's, a wide net of things you're allowed to do versus saying do we have a program for this or a program for that specifically it's saying what can't we do and there's very little COVID related you cannot do um, and just to clarify I did receive an email I see since we started um, that it sounds like because of the Monday holiday that they're going to start the applications on October 13th. Ooh, I never um, of that. So I, I just thought maybe uh, in case people try to apply on the 12th, <laughs> yeah. they may. Good point. Uh, yeah, good good point. Our resolution stated October 12th, and I, I yeah. suppose uh, uh, we, uh, you know, as a body, we're not so focused on whether or not that was going to be a, a state holiday, but more on whether or not we get these funds out quickly to those that were Along that line, maybe we didn't make it fully clear, is that state staff are not going to be processing these. The state is going to enter into a contract with a large accounting firm, probably, to administer this. And they're in negotiations on that now. And the October 12th was an estimated date provided by the governor's staff, who is handling negotiations with those accounting firms. Because as you can imagine from what we said today, there's a lot to get done between now and then. I think it's worth noting too that that the resolution that was passed gives the governor's office um, 
some room to, to adjust and change as things happen. So obviously throughout this entire process, uh, or since the pandemic hit in March, things have changed um, dramatically. And so this gives uh, a lot of room for those, uh, for the governor's office and the governor to, uh, to adjust as, as need be to make sure that we're, we're getting the funds to the right spots. So then, uh, final question here, and uh, this will maybe kind of help direct um, other individuals. Uh, but obviously, the LAIC and the, the chamber will have um, a lot of information if people have questions. Uh, but if, if for some reason um, they want to go elsewhere for information or get uh, answers to questions, what would you three suggest that, that they do? Is there a website that they can go to? Uh, can they contact you? Um, like I said, they can certainly contact the chamber in LAIC, um, but all avenues um, would, be, would be great to uh, announce here, I guess. That's a great and very fair question, and because we do want folks to know where they need to go for the resources, they're certainly welcome to contact any of us. Honestly, we are not experts in the details of some of these things, as nobody can be an expert in everything. We rely on the Bureau of Finance Management and their website, the BFM website that the state maintains relative to these programs. And, and our impression is, from everything we've heard, is that the applications and the procedures, the guidelines, the protocols, whatever term you want to use for that, will be on the BFM's state website. If people have questions with that, uh, we'll help, if you need, get you through some of that and get you directed to the people who can resolve those issues. I've, I've told people who, you know, have asked me about when, when we can start to see an application process. I said, well, I, I think the governor's office will push out a press release. It should be on TV, newspapers, everything, once we get that application in place. So I think it'll be widespread, but I said you could contact any of us and we'd try to get, get you started on the application process. I, I would just add in there, I think it's uh, important and I thank you guys for working with your members and your, your investors um, to, to get this information out. Uh, again, uh, those dates for the application could adjust one way or another, um, but we do know it's going to be a short window e either way. It's not a, it's not a long extended time. And I, you know, by all accounts, we don't believe there's a, a second chance to that. So when that window closes that application, um, then we're, then we're kind of, our hands are really tied as far as it, being able to help somebody, somebody get back into that. So, um, so I, I thank you guys for, for, for hosting this and helping getting that information out so that people are looking for it, getting prepared and looking for the opportunity to get these, uh, to apply for these programs. Great, thank you, uh, Representative Meiji, Representative Gross, Senator Crabtree, uh, for giving us all of this, this information. Uh, main things, get your financials ready, uh, get ready to apply, and um, if you have questions, there are several avenues that you can reach out and, and get your answers uh, to your questions. Thanks again for joining us, and uh, have a great rest of your week.